It's me, Ed the Sock. Welcome to the first edition of the new Rock Talk. Now, I've been told that this is uh, hosted by Greg Godovitz, but I'm pretty sure Greg Godovitz died several years ago. Um, I have an unreasonable authority that he's actually deceased. Um, so I'm quite curious to see if they're going to do a weekend at Bernie's kind of thing and dig up his corpse and have him sit there, uh, pull some uh, dental floss to make his jaw move. That would actually be more interesting than the real Greg Godovitz being there. Um, but he's going to be speaking to uh, Eddie Kramer, who uh, had a little bit to do with Jimi Hendrix and has quite a career history in rock. So uh, uh, stick around. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen when we throw to this. Allegedly, there will be some entity there calling itself Greg Godovitz. Uh, so uh, without any further ado, here's, here's something. Well, thank you, Ed the Sock, for those um, very kind words. We'll have to uh, have him back on again. Welcome to the first episode of Rock Talk. Now, in 2006, I think just around this time in 2006, the first episode of Rock Talk went on the air at CFRB Radio here in Toronto. And uh, then when I moved to Calgary, that was the end of that show. After all of these years have gone by, we decided that I would do a podcast based on the same premise as what we had with Rock Talk in the first place. We're going to talk to all the people in the music business that make the wheels spin. So it's not only going to be the rock stars and the, the songwriters, but there'll be authors that write books about rock. There'll be technicians. I mean, wouldn't it be great to have uh, the guy that did all the lighting for Rush all those years or my old friend that did drums for Neil Peart? Those kind of people. We'll have producers, we'll have engineers, and that's what we're gonna to get to today. What we won't have today is the following. We're not gonna talk about our current situation. We've all heard too much about it. We're not gonna talk about my hair because we all know it's a disaster. And we are especially not gonna talk about the first time I went to dinner at Eddie and AJ Kramer's place and broke an incredible piece of antique rock history given to Eddie by a very famous rock star. We are not going to talk about that today. And having said that, he's the most recorded record engineer and producer in the history of music. He might disagree, but that's the way I see him. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Rock Talk, my dear friend, Eddie Kramer. Hello, Gregory. Good to see you. I hope you enjoyed that little, uh, that little bit that I came up with for you, Edwin. It was delightful. I see you're sitting in front of uh, three of your wonderful Hendrix, well-deserved Hendrix. Uh, there we go. We got the first album. We've got Axis, and we've got uh, Electric Ladyland. By the looks of it, there. <laughs> hey, we could do this all day, you know. <laughs> oh, we have we have dancers that we'll we'll, we'll put in oh, there. Oh, cool! With I'm, I'm waiting for them to come in with their veils and all of that. <laughs> It's great of you to take the time. So I think the first thing that we should do is, you know, for people that, you know, anybody living under a rock someplace that doesn't, has never heard of you or the people you've worked with, I'm just going to give a, a quick list of the people that you have. And I'm going to have to read this because there's so bloody many of them. You big show off you. But we'll start with Jimi Hendrix, Led Zeppelin, Kiss, Santana, Peter Frampton, The Rolling Stones, The Kinks, The Beatles. Uh, Joe Cocker, Derek and the Dominoes, Bad Company, David Bowie. We've got four pages worth of these things that I'm going to just quickly hold up that are full of the most famous artists that ever recorded. And you recorded all of these people. I mean, that's incredible. But let's start with how, how, did, you, how did you get into the business in the first place? Well, first place, when you started to read it, I suddenly got very tired. <laughs> <laughs> I just realized, wait a minute, I've been in the bloody business 59 years. Oh, Gordon, I'm still doing it. No. <laughs> and I know you. Ah. That's the worst part of it, I know. <laughs> well, you know. So you, you, you were born in, uh, in Cape Town uh, in uh, South, uh, South Africa. South Africa, yeah. And so how did it start for you? Well, firstly, I was born. Actually, it's a funny story about being born, uh, if I may. Please. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. <laughs> You're the star. You can do whatever you want. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so uh, apparently, um, the night I was born, which was April 19th, 1942, um, my mom told me the story after the fact, of course. 
she was a very funny lady. She was um, an East Ender from East End of London, uh, Cockney, born and bred, tough as nails. She uh, moved out to South Africa in 1939, uh, just as war was breaking out. And um, anyway, she, she tells me the story. <laughs> On April 19th, just before midnight, I was born. And the nurse came over to her and said, Mrs. Kramer, you know, you're you're very lucky your son was born on this date, because if he had been born on the next date, he would have been born on Hitler's birthday. You're very lucky. And my mom said, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> so what, what got you? You went to England first to start your or did you start recording when you were in South Africa? No. Well, um, so being born in Cape Town, I'm a lovely family. My, my mom and dad were very odd artistically driven my my mom sculpted and painted my dad was an amateur violinist it was like um the crucible of all the intellectuals and artists in in cape town so ha having been raised in this wonderful family of of musicians and artists and intellectuals and all of that i started gravitating to the piano at the age of four and um really fell in love with classical music because my dad would play classical music all day and all night, you know, and I learned how to take 78 RPM records, the classical 12 inch ones and stick them on a record player, an automatic garage, and then they would just drop down one up to the other because you know how that worked. And I used to stand there and conduct to the music. So that was my musical upbringing was classical music. By the time I was a teenager, uh, you know, 12, 13, I was, you know, I've been studying classical piano for since I was four or five. I got into jazz and then I got into listening to the Voice of America and the BBC Overseas radio service and I heard rock and I went, wow, Elvis Presley, man, this was so cool. And that's what started the rut. Now, this is, I find this really intriguing because I've only ever heard you play the piano twice. When we first met, you were on, I don't know what kind of a grand piano it was in that palace that you were living in at the time, but you were playing like a Mozart piece or something. And I'm going, who the hell is that? And I walk in and that's you playing. I went, my God, listen to this guy play the piano. And then the second time was when I bought you that towel piano and uh, one from my granddaughter and Christmas Eve, you were on the floor playing something on a piano that with 88 keys. But you never, I never see you picking up an instrument. I mean, do you ever play on anybody's records? Have you ever played piano on somebody's tracks? Yes, <clears throat> actually I played on a Kiss. Uh, <laughs> oh dear, oh dear, now we're diving, diving deep. Uh, a Kiss record I played on, uh, what was it, something 16? Christine 16, and I play the, the sort of clang, 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 clang. I, you know, I played it tinkled around in the studio. You didn't do Beth, though, with them, right? No. The song no. Beth? So, okay. Uh, we're going to get to the kiss, uh, the kiss here. No, I, I happen to know that you, when you started and you went to England, uh, and you could tell me what studio it was in where the kinks were recording. So, um, Got to England in 1960 after two trips prior to that. 49, we were there for a year. 56, we were there for a year. And came back to South Africa. And then after the Sharpville riots and the, and the main riots in Cape Town, my dad said, we're out of here. And he, I left uh, six months after they had already come to England. And I arrived in uh, London in December of 1960. And perfect timing. The whole scene was changing in London. It was so magnificent. You know, watching the Beatles on TV for the first time was like, what? Black and white. I was looking at these guys and going, holy crap, this is amazing. And who knew I would, you know, five years later, I'd be recording them. But that's another story. <laughs> we'll but, get to you that. Know, but, but, join, but getting into London at that point in time was very uh, important for me because I got to learn about the city, I had no idea. You know, I was a messenger boy. I went to work at an ad agency. And that's when I kind of figured out if I combine electronics, which is one of my loves and music, hmm, let me see, what is that? Ah, recording engineer. And I picked up the TV yearbook 
opened it up, closed my eyes and with a pen, I just hit it six times and wrote off letters to all these various recording studios. And one of them came back, it was Ad Vision Studios and that was uh, 1962. And that's when I first started in the business. So from Ad Vision to Pi, which is answering your question about the kinks, cause that's where it's, you know, Pi Records, Pi Studios. That's where, we, uh, what's his name? Shell Talmy was the producer. Shell Talmy was the producer, yeah. yeah. And I believe uh, there's somebody from a band that we know may have played guitar on this that wasn't in the band. Yes, uh, Jimmy Page, perhaps? Never heard of him. <laughs> now, what was your function at Pi? I mean, were you a, were you a tape op or were you the T-boy? I was, you know, from AdVision where I was a general dog's buddy, you know, clean the toilets, run messages kind of guy, learning myself just watching people because you know there were no schools in those days you just learn by keeping your ears open and your eyes open and your mouth shut and you just you learn uh by the time i got to pi i was an assistant an official assistant from by the way ad vision was mono pi was three track and i went whoa three track <laughs> so many tracks what do you do you know yeah and uh yeah i was tape up do you know one thing I want to inject here for, for people th that know that we're friends? Uh, they, they're always saying to me, you must pick his brain like crazy about what he's done. And I said, well, to tell you the truth, we don't talk about that. So this is this is new for me to you know sit here and ask you this. And they said, well, well what the heck do you and Eddie Kramer talk about? And I said, well, he'll be chopping up the garlic. And I'll say, I don't know, man. I think that's a bit too much garlic to go into the sauce. you know." And it's true, right? Oh, it's true. Yeah, you know, I mean, I mean we, we talk about music occasionally. I mean, we talk about stuff that you've done or that I've done working. That, what you're working on, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but it's... But the history, I mean, I've read all the books, so I know your history. But I have to admit, I never knew that you were marginally involved with, you know, you really got me and all day and all of the night until I saw your slide presentation one night at that university. I went... Now that's impressive. I mean, you know, forget all that other stuff you did. The kinks. Wow. Cool. You know, you've had a long, you know, a long serving relationship with Jimi Hendrix. And I want to get into that now. How did you how did you come to, to get involved with him? And what the heck went through your mind the first time you heard him play? Ah, yes. Well, that deserves a bit of a backstory because um, from Pi, which I was I was there for about a year. Um, and then I went to uh, have my own studio. Uh, and that was really a challenge. From Pi, I started my own studio, which was a little demo studio. And it was a little funky, had egg boxes on the wall. But so, funnily enough, some of our earlier clients were members of the Kinks. And some of the other rock bands, well, certainly blues guys were wanting to come in and record. Uh, John Mayall, um, some of our clients. I was terrible as a businessman, I have to tell you. I had no clue how to run a studio, but I learned how to record even more so at that point when I was on my own, because everything I did myself, I had to learn how to cut discs, which I had some knowledge of. And then how to make it all work in, in a small little room with these guys. And it was great. And we were making great demos. We were bought out by Regent Sound. Now Regent Sound was the company that recorded the Rolling Stones and a whole bunch of other bands. They bought us out and said, hey, come and build our new studio, which we did. And then I, was, I wasn't that happy with the guy who was running the place. And uh, we had a bit of a disagreement, shall we say, and I knew <laughs> that there was a new studio coming together that I really wanted to join. It was called Olympic. And I bugged the, the, the chief engineer there uh, until I got an interview and I went down there and talked to him and I got the gig. This was the old Olympic studios in the center of London. They were about to move the studio because it was gonna, this building was gonna be knocked down. It was an old church. Uh, that later became deconsecrated and then was a synagogue. And after that, it became the studio. Who knew? Um, so that studio was being built. 
way, way, way from the center of London. This was in a beautiful part of London called Barnes over the Hammersmith Bridge. And all the musicians and all the people we talked to said, you guys are gonna be crazy. You're a half an hour away from the center of London. It proved them wrong. When Olympic opened, it took off like a rocket because it was the greatest sounding room in London at the time. And we were in competition with EMI and Philips. All the major labels had their own studio, Philips, Pi, Decca, you know, the whole bunch of them. Cut to January of 1967. I've been at this, the studio just opened maybe a couple of months before. And my first big client was Mr. Hendricks. And how I got to record him was a phone call. Attention, people of Earth. You will go to shopgreatgodofits.com now and order his books, or else I know where you live. That is all. I got a phone call from the front desk. The lady who ran the studio at that time, her name was Anna Menzies. Wonderful woman. Everybody was fancy, all the young engineers, we all fancied her, you know, she wore these beautiful white blouses and the tight stockings with the seams down them. And we all thought she was amazing. You couldn't go near her with a temper pole because you would get <laughs> fired and hung, drawn and quartered, whatever. But she had this beautiful <clears throat> plummy English voice and she, was, and she called me up on the phone. She said, oh, Eddie, there's this American chappy with the very big hair and you do all that weird <laughs> shit anyway. So why don't you do him? And that's literally how I got to record Mr. Hendricks. So what did you think? The, so Chaz was with him then, right? Chaz Chandler. Uh, Chaz, for those that don't know, Chaz was the bass player of the Animals. Chaz being the bass player of the Animals goes to America, finds Jimmy, comes to England, puts the band together, blah, blah, blah. And we all know that story because as young engineers, we, by, by just by looking in the trade papers, the melody maker and whatever, Hendrix, and we hear him on the radio, you know, hey Joe, it was already cut, that was already out. But Jimmy and Chaz were very unhappy with the studios that they were working in uh, because one of the studios was beneath a bank in the, ba in the basement. And uh, they couldn't play uh, until like five o'clock at night. And then, you know, during the day, if they tried to, the bank manager would, you know, ring on the doorbell and say, hey, keep it quiet. And of course, Hendrix with his <laughs> martial arms. So they were not happy campers. And they heard about Olympic. They came to, see, I think Chaz came to see it. And then bang, we're in. Were you guys wearing day, the white coats back in the day? No, That no, didn't go on at Olympic, right? No, the white coats was the BBC and EMI Abbey Road. Right. Those guys wore the white coats. The engineers who were, all, the audio engineers, uh, they didn't. It was the tech guys who would come in with the right. lab coats on and, you know, the pens in the little pocket and all of that. So the, the first time, I guess you would have heard him noodling around and getting sounds on the amp. But when he when he started ripping it up, what, what went through your mind when you, you and your assistants when you looked around the room and listened to this, what we're hearing here? Well, I distinctly remember Jimmy coming into the studio and sitting in the corner and um, it was a very cold day in January. And he was huddled up with this sort of white raincoat sort of wrapped around him. And he was just sitting there like this, not saying anything. The amps had come in, we were setting that up and the drums and the bass. And so I got that all set up and started miking up all the drums, the bass, and then his guitar amp. And once that was done, he walked over, plugged in, and hit a chord and I almost passed out. I, I could not believe what I was hearing. Can you imagine standing in front of Hendrix's Marshall and you hear that sound that it just, it just rips right through you. The hair stands up on the back of your head and you go, oh Jesus God. And he was playing loud as well, right? You know, not stage volume. Now, no, very interesting. The, the interesting thing, Jimmy was very, I mean, yes, loud for solos, but for rhythm, you know, medium to 
Lau, don't forget, Chaz was on on his case. He's just back it off, Jimmy, back it off, because we're recording this. It's not a live show, you know. And he wanted to make sure that the, the rhythm guitar sounded really great, which it did. But you know Jimmy's technique, he played lead and rhythm at the same time. Right, so, right. But I figured out, okay, that sound is just so overwhelming. And I put the mic where I thought it should be. There's a ribbon microphone. Ran up into the control room, got some sounds together, put some reverb, a little delay, a little EQ. And I said, Jimmy, come in and have a quick listen. And he came into the control room and I played a piece back to him. He said, uh-huh. He was looking at me. He was giving me, huh, okay. And he, he walks back out into the studio and he starts twiddling with his pedals in the amp. And he, he's looking at me like, okay, try this. <laughs> so I'm recording another piece and the sound had changed. I was twiddling more knobs and that's why I became a knob twiddler, mate. <laughs> I'm going to show you something and I want your, your, uh, your first thoughts on what you're about to see here. That's a blank canvas. Nice. Oh, sorry. Just kidding. Let's do it like this, like that. Remember this one? Oh, yeah, yeah. Jimmy's, um, well, we're just about to cut uh, Are You Experienced? And he's just rehearsing it uh, with, the, with the headphones on, just checking out. So we were about to do a solo, in fact. And I ran in the studio and just, just grabbed a quick shot of him. Incredible. I mean, uh, now... Did anybody, you took pictures, because I know we've, we've sat around and you've shown me a lot of the contact sheets. You must have taken tens of thousands of photographs of all the people. Not that, not that many? No. Thousands? Possibly. A pretty amazing collection. What are you planning to do with all those? A coffee table book? Um, I was going to give them to you, but I thought the better of it. <laughs> Well, think about that, though. I mean, uh, you know, still time to add that to the old will, as they say. Yes, the old will. Thank yes. you. Yeah, the, the old will. Nice. Nice. We've got, we've got a uh, a hat here full of questions. Oh, I from... thought there was going to be money in there. No, there's no money yet involved. No money at all. Yes. Uh, I'll, I'll bring you some Japanese food the next time I come down. <laughs> but this, these are questions. So I'm going to dig in here and... Uh, from the from the, our viewers listeners, this is a question right here. It's from oh yeah, fellow, I can read that from you. Uh, no, I'm going to read it too. But it's from <laughs> a fellow called Max Brand. He's a well-known guy around Toronto. Uh, he wants to know what the challenges were in recording Jimi Hendrix. Getting it on tape in the first place. <laughs> Why Gee, the volume? Well, it, okay. Put anybody think about it. Just put yourself in the position you're. A young engineer, right? This is Jimi Hendrix, and the sound is like unbelievable. He's, he's, one of the, he's the greatest guitar player that's ever lived. From the point that I met him, from the point where I described hearing that sound, my life changed. From that moment, everything changed because I got involved with this guy who uh, was so brilliant and so communicative with his sound. The, the, Look, when he played in the studio, it was the, the vision that I have of him is it's created up here in his brain. And in a nanosecond, it comes through his brain, to his heart, through his fingers, out the guitar, out the amp. And it's one continuous flow of energy. And to capture that, you got to have your shit together <laughs> because you want to try to be slightly ahead of what he's doing. You have to think on your feet, on your toes, what's he gonna be doing next? Because you've gotta be ready. And always, always, always have the tape running because you never know what's gonna come out. I was gonna ask you that because I know with the Beatles and stuff, they would have a, what was it, two track or half track running all the I time? Always had, I always had a seven and a half IPS quarter inch tape running. Now, right. for folks out there who don't know what tape is, yes, it's made from <laughs> oxide and it's about this thin. And then you cut it with a razor blade, see? <laughs> I used to, it used to kill me watching you guys cut and edit two inch tape. Oh yeah, that's a And lot. you'd hear that. <laughs> and I couldn't believe that you guys could hear the exact spot. Did you ever cut one of those tapes where you missed it and had to put it back together and do it oh, again? Yeah, yeah. Many times, but that's oh. part of the, it's part of the experience. I mean, you gotta have to, 
all right, you know, you might make a mistake and hopefully you don't, but it's, it's experience listening to where the dead spot, you have to find that point where it's right there and you put the grease pencil on it. Me too. Eddie, I've got another question from a fellow named Sean O'Shea, and I thought this was a pretty good one. He's not Irish by any chance, is he? Polish, I thought, at first, oh, like yeah. much like myself. Uh, his question from Sean O'Shea is, uh, how pissed off was Noel Redding when Jimmy started recording the bass parts? <laughs> okay, here's a story that illustrates the amount of pissed offedness. Uh, <laughs> So we're, we're in the studio and we're about to cut all along the watchtower. And Jimmy says to Noel, hey man, listen, I'm gonna play bass on this. And Noel goes, ah, rah, 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 rah. he goes off to the pub and gets completely pissed. And Jimmy plays bass. Well, of course he does because he's a fantastic bass player. But the initial recording of that, which I don't know we could get into that, but it's, Jimmy uh, on a six string and Dave Mason on a 12 uh, and Mitch, and that's it. But the initial like couple of takes is like, I never heard Jimmy lose, not lose it, but he was yelling at Mitch, come on, man. Because what he wanted him to do was to, he heard him play it with the time gets shifted. It just, he turns the beat around and Jimmy thought that was cool and he wanted him to do it again. It cost him like, and he, you could just see, I never seen Jimmy do that before, but it was the only time he really got pissed. Then he got pissed at, off of Dave Mason because all Dave Mason had to do was shrang, 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 right? And Jimmy's playing all, all the, you know, the moving parts. Some reason, I don't know what Dave was smoking that day, whatever. Finally, he gets it together and the track, we're cutting it, it's great, we're moving along and we're about take number 18. And all of a sudden I'm hearing in the background, this weird off time, out of tune, horrible chords of the piano. And it's going clang, 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 clang. <laughs> and it's just horrendous. And I've got, I can just about see into the studio. It looks a little dark out there. Oh, it's Brian, freaking Brian Jones from the Stones. He had stumbled into, because you know, Brian was a good friend of Jimmy's. He had stumbled into the studio and, and Jimmy is looking at me, like, get him out of here, you know? So I walk into the studio, Brian, Brian, come here, man. Yeah, yeah, what's happening? Oh, no, he's obviously out of his, he's completely out of his brain. Come on, Brian, come in the, uh, in the studio, come in the control room. So he came into the control room and he collapsed down in front of the console, out, he was gone. And then we proceeded to cut the track and that was it. Eddie says that's it, but is it? Will Brian Jones wake up from under that console? Will we ever find out about that antique that I broke the first time I had dinner at the Kramers? Tune in next Saturday and all will be revealed. Thanks for watching.